please stand for the reading of God's word? 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. So good to see you after two weeks, or two Sundays at least, away for me. So if you don't know who I am, my name is Dave, and I teach here regularly, but uh, you may need to be reacquainted with me. Um, it's great. I would echo all of Mark's comments, so I won't repeat them, but great to be together in this space again. And um, I, I'll just give you a little um, update. I, I try to make it now in the last couple of years uh, a regular rhythm to get away for a little bit at the beginning of the summer, which is the best time for me to get away. And so I, that's what I have been doing when you haven't seen me. Uh, and I want to give you a couple photos of two trips I was able to take. So first, one of you that is in this room right now, family in this room, uh, offered me your uh, mammoth cabin, which was amazing. So I spent three days in mammoth by myself, which was absolutely wonderful. And I would wake up each day. And I would pack a lunch, and I'd hit the trail of Mammoth Lakes and, and hike to one of the lakes. And, you know, it's funny. We grew up going to Mammoth uh, uh, during Christmas, and then we'd go past Mammoth in the summers. But I've never spent summers in Mammoth. I had no idea how beautiful uh, the Mammoth Lakes area is. There's tons of lakes just like this, just secluded little lakes. And so I had a lot of just time of quiet uh, in beauty, which is kind of my happy place. Quiet and beauty equals Dave very happy. Um, so I was in my happy place for three straight days. And then I got to go on a trip um, with 10 other pastors uh, that Compassion International put on. And they, they took us to the Minnesota-Canada border for three days of fishing. So here's us going out uh, at a Lake of the Woods. Look it up, guys. It's in the middle of nowhere, this massive lake. Um, that freezes over, of course, in the winter, which is amazing to me that that much water can actually freeze, but uh, the cold is relentless up there in the wintertime. But we got perfect weather, so we, we were staying on these two houseboats, and we'd wake up, have a really good breakfast, and then we'd go out and fish for walleye and pike and, and muskies. You all know about walleye, pike, and muskies. In the morning... Uh, and then we would end up on some secluded little island for lunch where the staff would cook us the fish that we had just caught. And uh, then we'd go out for another uh, couple hours of fish and then go back to the houseboats for an amazing meal and all that. So all that to say, um, that's what I've been up to uh, since you last saw me. And um, I am refreshed, which feels really good after a full year. And I've had wonderful time with the Lord and... Um, I could tell a lot more, but reconnecting with, I think, uh, it's always good to reconnect with God. Who's God made us to be? Who are we? And, and what, is, what is our identity in Christ? And so that feels really good. So I'm grateful to be back, but I was grateful to get away. And let me remind you what we're doing right now. All, all year long, we're in this series on the kingdom. And I'm going to give you a, a, an image today, or a metaphor for how this series is going that I didn't give you before. Is it now gone? Have we lost it? Okay. Um, one more. Oh, no. There's an image of a tree, and if you can't, you can all picture a tree. Um, I'll come to that quote in a second. So if you can get the tree up, great. If not, don't worry about it. Um, so, you know, we've been talking about the kingdom. So I want you to picture a tree, and then picture you can see underground the tree to the roots, right? So the first half of this year, we were talking about the, the kingdom fruit. What, what is kingdom life that Jesus invites us into? This life of love, of truth speaking, of justice seeking, of mercy, of all, you know, the Sermon on the Mount essentially is kingdom life. And then what we've turned to is we're, now we're looking at the roots and asking the question, what are these core practices and rhythms that we need to be engaged in so our lives are rooted in God's grace so that we can then produce the fruit of the kingdom? 
So we started with this basic root of looking for three weeks at the Word of God. Our lives need to be rooted in God's Word. And now we're looking at this issue of the church community. Our lives need to be rooted in the church community. We also look at being rooted in prayer. We'll look at being rooted in the Sabbath, these other basic ways that we connect with God's grace. But right now we're, we're spending about three weeks looking at rooting ourselves in the church community. So Daniel Gaiman kicked this, this idea off two weeks ago. We talked about that we are the body of Christ. We're God's temple. And we're out to, to grow up into Christ together. Then last week we got to hear from the body of faith as you all shared um, your stories and what's been going on this last year. So I thought it would be good. Today, in one sense today, there's nothing new about today, but symbolically for us, this, this day represents something. We're back in the sanctuary, and um, that's a big thing. So I thought it would be great on um, this day to be focused on the church community. And really what I want to do this morning is, as we move into this kind of new season in our church's life, to call you in to engage in this church community in a fresh way. You may be deeply engaged, you may be barely engaged, but however you're engaged, today feels like the right day to say, we want to invite you into this community, to, to dive into this community, because this is, this is God's plan for you. And my theme today that I get from this passage is, as, as I invite you into this community, I want to invite you into a community that is both broken and beautiful, okay? That's our theme, that you are invited to this community that is both broken and beautiful. And what I want to say is that is that broken and, be- and beautiful community is precisely what God has for you in your own sanctification, okay? So before we look at this passage, let me just say one last thing. Like if you are God, okay, and you're wanting to do a particular work in a group of people, how would you do it? And what, what's hard about this question is when we think of ourselves and we're not God and we think about our, our own goals for our lives, um, we come up with certain answers. Like, what is your ultimate goal for your life, okay? If you were just to sit back, and how do you actually live your days? Like, how do you, what are you actually going after as you live your days? And I think we get all sorts of answers. Um, happiness, um, self-fulfillment, comfort, some people might say, success, or, or wealth, or self-actualization, right? Whatever, whatever those goals might be, we all live with those. And depending on what those goals are, we might look at the church community and go, I'm not sure that this community is going to help me fulfill the goals that I have. So I might keep this community at at a distance, or I'll engage it in as much as I think it'll help me fulfill these goals. But God, as he looks at his people, has a very particular goal for them that is very clear in Scripture. And here's whatever your goals for your life are, here's God's goal for you. He wants to make you like his son, Jesus. That's his goal. His goal is, as Paul says in Romans, to conform you to the image of his son. He wants to turn turn you into a person who looks like a day version of Jesus or a you you version of Jesus. Or another way of saying this is he wants to produce the fruit of the Spirit in you, Christ-like characters. He wants to produce love in you and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control and all of these things. If that is God's goal for every one of us, then this broken and beautiful community is the perfect tool to do that. He wants to throw us all together and, and, and say, now I want you to figure out how to love each other, how to forgive each other, how to live the life of my son together so that you can glorify me together. All right? That's what God is up to. And so I want to just talk through that. I want to look at this community that he's given us and uh, just be honest about what it is and what it isn't. So let's look at this passage, great passage, and um, let's start with this theme of broken. I want to I talk about the brokenness and the beauty of church, of Grace Fellowship Church, and we'll see that in this passage. Um, we see, I'll, I'll look at, let's look at verse 8 and 9 to see the brokenness of this community. Uh, let me read it again. Verse 8, above all, love each other deeply because covers over a multitude of sins, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Okay, there's two phrases in there that that capture the brokenness of church. And the first is that ominous phrase, a multitude of sins. How's that for a a tasty phrase, right? A multitude of sins. Uh, Let's just be honest. To step into a local church body is to step into a multitude of sins. Mark was kind of 
touching on that earlier, right? A multitude of sins is what exists in this room right now, right? And just think about yourself for a moment. Think about your own life and your own dysfunctions, your own selfishness, your own addictions, your own whatever, dysfunctions, okay? And I've been a pastor now for 18 years. What I have learned in 18 years is that people's lives are darker than you think they are. Or they're certainly darker than I thought they were. But this is, each one of us carries with us a multitude of sins, and then you just extrapolate that to how many people we have in this room. And when you do that, you get the second word, which we saw in verse 9, is the word grumbling. And grumbling is what you get when you get a bunch of sinners and you throw them into a room together, right? Right? Because it's, it's not just that I have my own, my own individual sins and you have your own individual sins, which is true, but the problem is my sins leak out and yours leak out and we sin against one another. And so we hurt each other and we wound each other and we offend each other and we annoy each other and we dismiss each other. We do all these things and so there's a lot of grumbling. So if, if you are new to grace, I just like spoiler alert, uh, this is a very broken community. And what's great is that I, you know, us on staff, we still have great job security in the midst of that because if you head like half a mile down and there's like seven other churches right with us, those are all really broken communities too. And in fact, every church that's ever existed has been a, a broken community. And I think like in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of resurgence of this idea of we got to get back to the early church. Like let's get back to the early church. There's sort of this romanticizing of the early church. And my response now is like, which, which early church would you like to go back to? Galatia, you know, Corinth, um, the seven churches in Revelation, like, what, which early church are you talking about? They're all broken churches. And I want to read you this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I've probably read it before. I love this. This is from his book, Life Together. The church is not an ideal, but it is a reality created by God. Innumerable times, a whole Christian community has broken down because it had sprung from a wish dream. The serious Christian set down for the first time in a Christian community is likely to bring with him a very definite idea of what Christian life together should be and to try to realize it. It's a good goal. God's grace speedily shatters such dreams. Just as surely as God desires to lead us to a knowledge of genuine Christian fellowship, so surely must we be overwhelmed by a great disillusionment with others, with Christians in general, and if we are fortunate, with ourselves. And I think that word disillusionment is a strong word. I want to I sit on that for a second. But I, I think every human being has to go through this healthy journey with a local church of you come in and there's an idealism that you might have. And then there's got to be at some point this series of this or this season of disillusionment where you recognize, oh, this is a broken place. But hopefully you can work through that to this more settled, realistic grateful experience of a community that is, simply put, broken. But I, I like that word disillusion because I, I think actually that word um, captures a lot of what we experienced in the last 15 months when it comes to church. There's been a lot of disillusionment. And you, you think about, take pandemic plus political tension plus racial tension. You just take that formula that we've experienced, and you have people in the same church falling in all sorts of different places on all those issues, and physically separated from one another, so they can't just grab coffee and hang like they normally do, okay? That's a bad formula, or it's actually a really good formula for disillusionment. And I think we at Grace and every church We've experienced disillusionment with one another, haven't we, some of us? I mean, some of you have heard your friends say certain things that you wouldn't have thought they'd say that have offended you, that you can't imagine. You've seen friends post things, probably even more so, that you are like, I don't know. I don't know if I, I thought I knew. I can't believe that's what you're posting. And, and there's a disillusionment with one another. We as church leaders, we've, we've made certain decisions, right? We haven't made other decisions. We've said certain things. We haven't said other, other things. And there's, there's some of you that have been disillusioned with us as church leaders over the last 15 months. Or some that have been disillusioned are no longer here because of that, right? And there's been, I mean, there's been a ton of movement 
between churches in the last 15 months. I'm, I'm calling it the COVID shuffle. You know, we just were, we're trying to figure that out. In one sense, that's, a, that's not a bad thing. Like, there's been a, a reset possibility that I think COVID allows people. So that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But my point being, relationships have been strained and challenged. Um, a multitude of sins and lots of grumbling. And it's just, it's been hard to be part of. Uh, and we've done pretty great, I think, as a church. But of course, we've had to weather that ourselves. But it's just this sober reminder that the church is a broken place, <laughs> full of broken people. So welcome to our version of brokenness here at Grace. So um, what is needed in the midst of that brokenness? Well, Peter gives us the answer in these two verses, right? Um, these two, they're, the answer is simple, simple to say and hard to do. First, verse 8, look at it. Above all, love each other deeply. Or I like the way the ESV puts it. It says, earnestly keep on loving each other. The idea is there's a proactivity. There's an earnestness to this. You've got to be eager to do it. We've got to be eager to care for one another, to lean into one another, to reach out to one another, to continue to consider what would be good for each other and to do that for one another. Why is that important? Because love covers, it says, a multitude of sins. And by covers, I don't think he means love denies sin or love pretends that sin doesn't exist. No, but love is this covering over the brokenness of a community, like a comforter that you put on at night. Love, love is this comforter, love is this, this covering, it's this balm to the community. Love is, in the midst of the brokenness, love is a glue that holds the community together in the midst of our brokenness. And so it is very important to keep on loving one another. And I think love is first and foremost a way of seeing each other, that we see each other, not primarily in terms of our brokenness and certainly in terms of what's offending us about each other, but that we see each other in terms of the fact that we are forgiven in Jesus Christ, right? We see each other in God's love, that, that God's love literally has covered over a multitude of sins at the cross, right? That, so I see you first and foremost as someone who's been forgiven by my Father God, and that's how I see you. Love is a way of seeing each other, and love then is a way of, of course, acting. I'm going to continue to pursue your good. I'm going to continue to lean in. I'm going to continue to care for you. I'm going to continue to listen to you and see you as a fellow, you know, brother, sister in this family, both sinners forgiven by God. That is what love is, and, and Peter says, above all, <laughs> Jesus says the same thing. This, above all, this is how the world's going to know that you're my followers, is that you love one another. Every community, religious, secular, political, every community has been broken and been disillusioned this year. What distinguishes, distinguishes Jesus' followers is Jesus' followers keep on loving one another through it. And so that's what we are called to do. And then there's a second word in verse 9, which I, I just love this word. It feels so re relevant. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. So in the first century, um, hospitality was like a cultural obligation. First century Eastern culture, someone's, you know, relatives are coming through town or someone's coming through town. You are obligated to provide a meal, to provide a place for them. But of course, you didn't have to do it with joy. You could do it grumbling, right? But they had to, they had to do this. And so Peter said, no, but do it sincerely. Do it without grumbling. And really, when you think about hospitality, the essence of hospitality is, I would define it as making room for another person, right? So we think of in physical hospitality, you're going to invite someone over for dinner or someone's going to stay the night, right? You, you make room for them. You, you clean the house. You set the table. You prepare a meal. You might uh, prepare a room and a bed for them to sleep in. You create a physical space. You create time in your calendar, you create a space, what I like to call a free and fearless space, for them to be there in safety, be with you. You get to speak the truth, they get to speak the truth, but you do that in this context of making room for them. And that physical picture is a great picture of what, what relational hospitality is. It's making room for one another, right? I have room for you. I'm going to create this space of safety where you can be yourself and we can be in relationship with one another. We can speak the truth to one another. This is a safe place to do that. And I just, the reason I think that's so relevant is 
I think people have just stopped making room for one another this year. Right? I mean, you think about what's happening in, in, in our nation. We're now, we have this, we call it this cancel culture, right? If you don't say the right thing, if you don't do the right thing, or if you just are silent, or you, any number of things, you're canceled. I mean, I don't have room for you. Right? If you, if, if you don't do it the way I think it should be done, I don't have room for you anymore. And that's not what we want to be. That's not what, that's not what Peter's inviting us into. No, I have room for you in the midst of our disagreements. You know, um, the word hospitality, the Greek word literally means love of stranger, okay? And so, you know, normally a stranger's coming to town, you want to offer hospitality. But he says, offer hospitality to one another. So offer love of stranger to one another. And the truth is, in this year, some of us have become strangers to each other, right? Like, there's people that were in your life, and you're like, I feel like I don't know you anymore. Like, not just because we haven't seen each other, but like, I thought I knew you, and now it feels like, man, we're on such different pages. And so maybe what we need to offer to one another, <laughs> to old friends even, is love of stranger, hospitality, making room for one another. And so I think one of the greatest questions of this summer as, as things kind of regather and, and happen is, how can we love one another in this community and outside of this community? How can we make room for each other in a fresh way? And so I, I want to just pause for a second. We've been talking about brokenness. We're going to move towards beauty, and this is going to turn and get a lot nicer in a second. But I want to just pause and actually give you space, like just 30 seconds, to just, as you hear this, to ask with the Lord, Lord, is there, is there anybody that you want me to love this summer? Or is there anybody that you want me to offer hospitality to? Um, and the easiest way to figure out who this person is is just ask yourself, who's the person I've been having conversations with a lot in my head lately? Right? Like, who's that person? Um, that's probably the person. And so um, maybe, maybe what you need to do is, is proactive love. You need to reach out to that person. You need to lean into that person. Maybe it's, not, maybe it's just the idea of making room, and you need to just go, you know, I've got room for this person again. I, I've got room. So whatever image might be helpful for you. But let's just take like 20 seconds, okay, before I move on. Just prayerfully consider. Is there someone? They might be in this room. They might be a friend. They might be on your street. That you're like, because I think as I sit with this, yeah, I think, God, I think you want me to, continue to love. I think you want me to lean in. I think you want me to make room. Let's just take a, a moment. All right, we're a broken community. Welcome to Grace Fellowship Church. But second, uh, the church is a beautiful community. And in this passage, particularly what I mean by beautiful, it is, it is a beautifully gifted community. And that's what Peter goes on to say in the second half of this passage. Look at verse 10. I love this verse. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms, okay? He's referring to the spiritual gifts that we've been given and that we're to use those to serve one another. But I want to sit with that phrase at the end of that verse, as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. That is a wonderful phrase, and I just want to tease that out for a second, okay? First, there's this word grace. We're stewards of God's grace. And a couple, like, Maybe a month or two ago, I talked about grace and how I think many of us have a very limited view of grace, that when we think of grace, we just think of grace is, is the thing you get when you mess up, right? I messed up and, oh, now I need grace. Grace is, is forgiveness. And grace is that, but grace is so much more than that in the Bible. Grace is, is all of God's unmerited favor towards us and all of the ways that that gets expressed in our lives. And so what we see in this passage is one of the ways that God's grace gets expressed is he gives us certain giftings. And man, you guys are such a gifted church. I mean, it's over the years, there are so many gifts in this church. But one of the ways God's grace comes to us is through 
gifts, uh, spiritual gifts. And so he, he refers to these, right, as, as stewards of God's grace. It says, in its various forms. That's translating one word in the Greek that means diverse or multicolored or varied. The idea is there's, there's a ton of variety in the spiritual gifts. And so one of the ways I've he- heard this described is through a Pink Floyd um, album. Um, <laughs> Uh, a book did it this way. So imagine that God's grace is the white light coming into a prison. The full spectrum of, of you know, a visible light that we can see is God's grace. It, it just comes at us, but it gets filtered. The prism is the church community, and it gets filtered through the church and breaks it up into all these different spiritual gifts that are all present in this room right now, right? All these different colors of light. So some of you are teachers. Some of you are really generous. Some of you are encouragers. Some of you are exhorters. Some of you are great in mercy. Some of you are great in administration. Some of you are leaders, right? All these different gifts that God has given us because God's grace is so varied and so, so multifaceted through your giftings. And that's really good because the needs in this room right now are also very diverse and unique and specific. And so God has created the church in such a way that the church can minister to itself through the gifts of its people. And so he goes on with this phrase, um, serve fa- as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So each one of you is to be a faithful steward of God's varied grace, okay? So I want you to stay with me here. So um, a steward is someone, right, who manages someone else's stuff, right? It's a manager. It's not your stuff, but you, you manage it for somebody. So you are a steward, and what you're managing is God's grace. The grace of the eternal God has been given to you through your giftings, and you get to steward that, in ways that bring him glory. So we always talk about financial stewardship, right? God gave, that's all belongs to God, and I want to steward it. Now we're talking about stewarding God's grace. <laughs> the grace of the eternal God has been given to you. You get to manage it in ways that bring God glory, meaning we get to be channels of God's grace to one another through the expression of our gifts, right? So it's pretty remarkable. So Right? Sometimes a brother or sister in this room is discouraged, and the God of the universe himself wants to encourage them. The God of the universe himself wants to do it, and so the way he's going to do it is he's going to put you in touch with them because you have the gift of encouragement. Right? Or someone in the church is feeling lonely, they're feeling unseen, or whatever, and, and the God of the universe wants them to know, I see you. And so he is going to put you in contact with them because you have the gift of mercy. You're a great listener. You create that safe space for people to feel known and loved. Or we could go the opposite. Sometimes you are in need. You are in need of some wisdom and insight. And God wants to give you that, so he puts you in touch with somebody in the body who is is gifted in teacher and gifted in wisdom. Or maybe what you need is a kick in the pants, you know, sometimes. Uh, You're wandering from God and you're not really caring. And God himself wants to draw you back, and so he brings someone with that gift of exhortation who speaks the truth in love, and you get to receive God's exhortation through that person, okay? I think you get the point. Pretty amazing thing to be on either side of that encounter, right? That you get to be the bearer of God's grace to another person, or you get to receive God's grace through another person. We get to, we get to be windows of God's grace to one another. We get to serve up God's grace to each other through the use of our gifts. So the point being then, I'm going to kind of land the plane here. So then we want to use our gifts in a way that points one another to God's grace. Look at how he goes on in verse 11. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God, right? If your gift, you have a speaking gift of teaching or exhortation or encouragement, you want to think, what would God want to say to this person right now? Right? I, I want to speak the very words of God. What, God, what, what is it you're wanting to say to this person? I'm going to try to say that as best I can. He goes on, if anyone serves, if your gifts aren't speaking but serving practical gifts, they should do so with the strength God provides, right? So I don't want to do this in my own strength. I want to do this relying on your grace, God, so that in all things God may be praised 
through Jesus Christ, right? We, get, we, we serve one another with our gifts so that God receives the glory, not so that the person that we just serve comes away going, oh man, John is such a gifted teacher, right? Or Sharon is just so generous. That's not what, The goal is they walk away from time with us and going, God, you met me today. God, you encouraged me. I so needed that from you today. Thank you for showing up, God, through my friend, through my brother or sister. I experienced your grace through them today. And you know, this, as we're back in this room, this, this is one expression of the body, right? One weekly expression. And the downside of this expression is you're all sitting this way, and it's really hard for all of us to exercise our gifts, <laughs> Right? There's only a couple people getting to do that in this context. So there's so many other contexts where we do church together throughout the week where really the gifts emerge particularly. But I do want to say this is a great opportunity um, to use your gifts. We have lots of practical needs right now as we gather. We, 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 we need help with our service. We need help with our kids. We need help with greeters. If you want to come and serve here, we have plenty of places to plug you in. Uh, but I love what Mark always says when people ask him, like, how can I serve? He's like, how many people are here? 150? Well, there's 150 service opportunities this morning, right? How do I engage one another? How do we engage one another and, and love each other and serve each other? All right. So I'm going to end with that. But I do, I do want to encourage you to, to consider um, in this sort of transition moment, what would it look like for me to lean into this community and, and serve in some fresh way? And you may be doing that a ton, like I said. You might not be doing it at all. But what would that next sort of level of, I want to offer whatever gifts you give me, God. I want to love this body of believers. I want to build it up um, with what you've given me. We want, we want to invite you to do that and encourage you to do that. We want to help you find your way into that space if you're open to that. All right, so um, welcome back to the church. This broken and beautiful community, this is the context where God wants to form Christ in you. This is what you, what you need to root your life in if you want Christ to be formed in you. You know, I, I want to go back to this. This is my happy place. I could spend the next 30 years pretty much alone in nature and be really happy. <laughs> Those of you who know me know that's true. And there's some good stuff that's going to happen there. Um, but Christ is not going to be formed in me there. I mean, part of him is going to be formed in me there. But God wants to form Christ in me, and you guys are the means that that's going to happen. Rubbing shoulders with you, doing life with you, engaging in the broken, beautiful lives that we have here. Um, that is actually how Christ, over time, is going to be formed in, in me so that I become a truly loving and not just a selfish person. And so I want to suggest that whatever, whatever that represents for you... <laughs> to know that, that that alone isn't going to do it. Um, maybe spiritual fulfillment, uh, self-improvement, all that can happen here, but the fruit of the Spirit, it takes place right here. And so I want to invite you into this. There's something about this thing called church that is exactly what God wants it to be. So let's lean in together this summer. Let's pray. Father, it is so good um, to be able to be in this space again, officially, and to see these just delightful friends full of such gifts and such brokenness, and that together we get to do this each week, and then, of course, midweek as well, and throughout our days is a true blessing. Would you give us a fresh appreciation for one another in all of our <laughs> mess, and a fresh desire to lean in, to love? Uh, I pray especially for those relationships, maybe present in this room or beyond this room, that are, that are really hard right now. They've just been hit hard by the last month, year or so. Um, would you do fresh work of reconciliation and mercy and, and um, affection even, affection for one another? So, Spirit, do your work. Form uh, this bond of unity that is yours to form, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>